Hi, welcome to Day by Day in Paul's letter to the Philippians. Today we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, and we're going to take a look at how Paul longed to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me go ahead and pray, and we'll get started. Father, thank you so much for the Word of God. Uh, God, I thank you for uh, passages like the one we're going to look at today, Father, where we are uh, made aware that we can have an intimate relationship with you. We can have a deeply personal and wonderful relationship. And yet, Father, you direct us and guide us in understanding some things so that words like that don't just fall into some kind of sappy spiritual sentimentality but that, Lord, there are some very serious things if we want to know Christ that we need to embrace. And, Lord, I pray that you will help us to understand those things today. Lord, that you will magnify the Lord Jesus Christ as a result of this and draw people to him. Father, please fill me with your Holy Spirit, as well as, Lord, all those who are listening today uh, also would have the Holy Spirit present in them, uh, with them, around them, Father, to open their minds and their hearts to the Scriptures. Lord, I pray that you will do all this in the name of your wonderful Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> so, we are in uh, today's day by day in Paul's letter to the Philippians. Uh, we are at Philippians 3 10 and 11. It's a very, very kind of famous and favorite passage of a lot of people. Uh, and we're going to jump right in. And it's just about Paul saying that I may know him. So, let's take a look at it. It says that I may know him, Philippians 3 10 and 11, by the way that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now, not all religions are alike. They do not all believe the same things, nor do they all lead to the same place. Christianity is distinct from other religions, all actually all other religions in the world, in that it does not teach a way to heaven that you can follow by obeying a certain set of rules or following a certain path. Uh, instead, Jesus said very clearly in John fourteen six, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Christians believe that in fulfillment of prophecy given hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born, it told that he would be born of a virgin in Bethlehem. He would go to Egypt and return to live in Nazareth, Nazareth of Galilee. He would be crucified with his hands and his feet pierced and would die. That he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver and that the one who betrayed him would be buried in a potter's field. Uh, that Jesus would die among thieves yet be buried as a rich man in his death. That three days after he died, he would rise from the dead. There are actually over 80 different prophecies about Jesus, all which came true in the same one person, Jesus Christ. All of this is astounding and proof that Jesus is who he says he is. He is God and man, and that he is the Savior and the only payment for sin that will bring us into a right relationship with God. Yet with all that said, and very, very true, another thing that distinguishes Christianity and Christians from all other religions, is that the very Jesus who died and rose again from the dead lives even to this day and beyond it for all eternity to be known by those who trust him, to be loved by those who trust him. Jesus still lives today, and those who have come to know him will know him personally, intimately, and experientially as the first and greatest goal of their lives. Now, that sets Christianity apart from all other religions because we are not only brought into a relationship with God, but we are called into an intimacy with God. Now, when we mention the word intimacy, when we mention the word that, that, that there's this close relationship with God, the problem we can fall into is that we would fall into just kind of the, the, the familiar, sappy thoughts of what a relationship is on a human level. And I can know the Lord Jesus Christ as the one who loves me. I can know him as actually my brother. I can know God as my God. I can know him as my father. But you know what? There's also some things in which when we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, there are some ways in knowing him experientially that 
need to come out and we need to grasp that this should be part of what it means to know the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's take a look at these things. Paul said that I may know him. The word know there speaks of an experiential knowledge. Paul came to know Jesus after the Damascus Road incident. That was when he was saved. That was when he was redeemed. But it was also his first introduction into a relationship with Jesus. He wanted to know Jesus more and more through interacting with him, more and more through daily spending time with him so that he might know him more personally, more personally and more infinitely or sorry, intimately. Paul wrote literally volumes of information about Jesus. He was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write more books slash letters than any other person in scripture. And yet he says, I want to know him. Paul in saying this is not saying, I want to know more about Jesus. I want to know more more information about him. I want to know more head knowledge so that I can regale people with how smart I am about spiritual things. No, he said, I want to know him, not I want to know about him. So when we take a look at this word know, when Paul says, I want to know him, the word know has basically a number of different meanings in English. Uh, as actually another language. It can mean to know, to have learned by serious study. This is the way that somebody knows subjects like history, mathematics, physics, chemistry, but it can also refer to understanding. That This is the way we use the word when we say, I know what's going on. Hey, I know what's happening here. It can even refer to a type of knowledge where you know something in your head But that knowledge really doesn't help you. It just kind of makes you a little arrogant about knowing a lot more than everybody else. Paul spoke of that in 1 Corinthians 8 when he said, Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. The man who thinks he knows something does not know as he ought to know yet. So the word here for know is the Greek word gnosko, which means to know experientially, to know personally, to actually experience something or in this case, someone. And this is to know them in such a way that affects the way that you and I live our daily lives. Now, uh, a a great Greek scholar, J.A. Moiter, basically saw this truth clearly, and he wrote this. We have largely lost the biblical dimension of the word knowledge in our customary use of it. We can find it almost to the contents of the brain. The Bible doesn't resist this meaning, but it would never accept it as a complete definition. First, the Bible and biblical words would add a practical dimension. Nothing is truly known unless it's being practiced in daily life or in some way allowed to control the conduct of the person that's involved. To depart from evil is understanding. And so that's what Job said, and and so we, we need to understand that. If you have understanding, then that's going to lead you to depart from evil. There's going to be an action that that corresponds with that knowledge. If there's no action that corresponds with the knowledge, it's really not scriptural knowledge or biblical knowledge. Secondly, in knowledge between persons, to know refers to the most deepest personal intimacy and contact. The Bible says Adam knew Eve not because it was too shy to speak openly about the fact that they had a sexual relationship, but because what the Bible is trying to tell us is the sexual relationship was just one aspect of the love between Adam and Eve. There was an intimacy. There was a knowledge between people. There was a deep, intimate union between them that was more than just a physical act. It involved a deep knowledge of each other, an understanding of each other, a willing to to talk to each other, walk with each other, work with each other, to live with each other. And so correspondingly, uh, to be wholly saved by Christ means that we want to know him in the most intimate ways possible. We want him to be a part of every aspect of our lives. There's some great quotes on this. F.B. Meyer wrote this, We may know him personally, intimately, face to face. Christ does not live back in the centuries, nor amidst the clouds of heaven. He is near us, with us, compassing our path in our lying down and acquainted with all of our ways. But we cannot know him in this mortal life except through the illumination and teaching of the Holy Spirit. And we must surely know Christ not as a stranger who turns in to visit for the night or as an exalted king of men, 
there must be the inner knowledge as of those whom he counts his own familiar friends, whom he trusts with his secrets, who actually eat with him of his own bread. To know Christ in the storm of battle, to know him in the valley of the shadow, to know him when the solar light irradiates our faces or when they are darkened with disappointment and sorrow, to know the sweetness of his dealing with bruised reeds and smoking flax, to know the tenderness of his sympathy and the strength of his right hand. All of this involves many varieties of experience on our part, but each of them, like facets of a glorious diamond, will reflect the prismatic beauty of his glory from a new angle. What a great quote by F.B. Meyer. But I can't go on without quoting from you, the, quoting to you what the Prince of Preachers said. Charles Spurgeon made this comment. They tell me he is a refiner, that he cleanses from spots. He has washed me in his precious blood, and to that extent I know him. They tell me that he clothes the naked. He has covered me with a garment of righteousness, and to that extent I know him. They tell me that he is a breaker and that he breaks fetters. He has set my soul at liberty, therefore I know him. They tell me he is a king and that he reigns over sin. He has subdued my enemies beneath his feet, and I know him in that character. They tell me he is a shepherd. I know him, for I am his sheep. They say he is a door. I have entered in through him, and I know him as a door. They say he is food. My spirit feeds on him uh, as on the bread of heaven, and therefore I know him as such. Listen, I mean, very few people write as wonderfully as Charles Spurgeon. But get what he's saying. We learn something of the Lord Jesus Christ from the scriptures, but God wants us to take that further into we walk in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We spend time with him. Let, let me bring out something right now that, that really in this time period we probably need. We need to increase that intimacy with Christ. We're in a situation now where a lot of us, we don't see people. If we see them, we see them through a screen, i.e. what we're doing right here. But we need to know this. COVID doesn't in any way impair the Lord Jesus Christ from being intimately and personally involved in your life. When Paul said, I want to know him, he was talking about the kind of intimacy that you and I can know that goes beyond, no, we shouldn't leave our homes or we shouldn't go in large groups or we shouldn't you know, do some of these things. We need to know every day we can wake up, open God's word, have that wonderful intimate time with Jesus. You know, the other day somebody said that, that when I was finishing praying at, at Sunday service, it was the first time that they had ever heard a, a term that I had used. And, and it was basically a term for everyday life. And, and they said, but that was probably the first time somebody ever heard that in prayer. And the, the funny thing is this, I was taught that I wasn't supposed to pray with these and thous and therefores and, you know, and, oh Lord, I hast come unto thee this day, you know, to seekest thee and to beholdest thee as I would beholdest one of a deep friendship. No, that's not how I talk to God. Talk to God like I talk to people. There's a sense of a deeper reverence and a deeper respect. There is an honest fear of God for who he is. But honestly, uh, you know, I say words like wackadoodle in God's presence. I, I, I talk to him. I, I want him to know what's going on in my life. Uh, and he does know. He already knows before I come. And yet there's that wonderful intimacy that I have with him. You know, I, I've got six kids I wanted my six kids to know that they could hop up in Pop's lap and Pop's going to have a conversation with them on the level they can understand. And they're okay. They can talk with Dad about things. They can laugh with Dad about things. They can enjoy time with Dad. And yet I was also there as someone that was older, hopefully someone that was wiser, someone that could help them and teach them and encourage them and guide them and do all the things that I needed to do. But in no way did I demand of my kids that they needed to come to me and like clap three times as they approached and, you know, refer to me as, oh, dad, who giveth me life as my father. You know, it's just like, no, that's not how we talk to him. There's a sense of intimacy. There's a sense of knowing him and loving him and, and, and seeking him and talking to him. I think one of the things that keeps people from intimacy is some sense of they've got to talk in King James if they're going to try to talk to God. 
and, and honestly, that's part of the reason I like modern versions of Scripture. I want them to be translations. I want them to be translations based on the, based on the Greek and the Hebrew text. But listen, if all we ever listen to is King James language, does it really surprise you that people think at times you have to talk like that to talk to God? I want you to know that's not even how the Old Testament spoke in Hebrew or Greek. It spoke in Koine Greek. It spoke in the common Greek of the people. It spoke in a basic common Hebrew. There was, and let me say, the, the, the writing of the King James, I'm not against it, but I'm just telling you that's how people talked in 1611. And therefore, that's how it was going to be translated. I don't talk in 1611. I talk like, I mean, we, we slaughter the Queen's English. I understand that, okay? But at the same time, I've got to be able to relate with God on the basis of who I am and where I am right now. Uh, yes, respect. Yes, honor. Yes, love. Yes, fear. Yes, you know, that, that I want to respect him and love him with all my heart. But listen, we've got to know him. Okay, Paul went on, and, and, and so this doesn't just fall into some kind of a sappy sentimentality. He went on and said some, some wonderful things we need to know. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. There were specifics about how Paul wanted to know Christ experientially, and here's why. No, he, Paul wanted to know Christ and the power of his resurrection because Paul realized there's no power in the law. All the law can do is show me that I'm a sinner. All the law can do is lock me in my sin. The law can show me righteousness, but the law in no way delivers me to where I can actually live out righteousness. There's no power in the law. There's no power in the flesh. My own flesh can't stop. Listen, one of the things that was an amazing revelation to me was in high school, I had a good friend of mine who was Catholic. He said, hey, for, for Lent, would you do me a favor? I said, sure. And what is it? And he said, would you quit using the Lord's name in vain during Lent? And I thought, sure. Okay, that sounds good. I'll, I'll try it. You know, I, I like you. And, you know, you're my friend. I, you know, I, I realize this offends you. So I tried. I made it one day. In fact, I don't even think I made it a day. And then after trying for a day, I tried not to. And honestly, it was like every fifth word I wanted to say. And then, you know, by the time the second day rolled around and then coming into the third day, I just gave up. There was no way I could do it. That was the first time I ever realized I didn't control my flesh. My flesh controlled me. Okay. Uh, there, there was sin and sin is powerful. And, and sin can control us if there's not a power that breaks the power of sin. So there's no power in the law. There's no power in the flesh. Listen, there's no power in the wisdom of the world. The world's trying to fix its own problems. And honestly, a lot of times, every time they try to fix one, they create five more. And then there's the simple problem of this. Who's going to fix selfishness? Who's going to fix self-centeredness? Who's going to fix that, 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 you know, I don't know, just the, the, the who's going to fix sin? The wisdom of the world can't help us. You know, okay, let's take it, let's take it to the, uh, the United Nations. Let's let the United Nations break the, ha the pattern and the habit of selfishness of all people. Your problem is simply going to be this. All the representatives at the United Nations, and I'm not against, look, I'm not trying to down everybody at the United Nations. I'm saying they're human like me, okay? If I was a major person in the United Nations, I'd be like just like them. And here's the problem. We're, gonna want, we're wanting them to, to fix selfishness. First things we got to do is fix the fact that all of us who are trying to fix it have the problem. Guys, there, there were philosophers out there that, that wrote this glorious philosophy, but in their own personal lives, they were a wreck. Paul said, Paul said, man, I want to know Christ. I want to know an intimacy with him, but I want to know an intimacy where I know the power of his resurrection. Listen, the resurrection has power of the spiritual realms. Colossians said, you know, God, God took all the rulers and the authorities and he made a public display of them openly, triumphing over them in the cross. Christ and, and the resurrection revealed power over the spiritual realms. There is no spirit, there is no power, there is no demon. There is nothing that has greater power than the Lord Jesus Christ. And he evidenced it by rising from the dead and, and, and basically displaying all those powers openly through the cross. It has, the resurrection has power of the physical realms. Jesus rose from the dead. Yeah, he died, but he rose from the dead. Death can't mess with him. Death has no power over him. Listen, 
the resurrection is the power of the wisdom of the world. Colossians said there are people that, that have their rules. Don't taste, don't touch. You know, there's, there are rules out there that people say, hey, there is no God. Don't even worry about him. There is no morality. Do what you want. There are people that wind up and become nihilists or nihilists or whatever term you use for that. And nihilists kill themselves. Do you know why they kill themselves? Because they can't live in the world that they're trying to create where there is no truth, there is no God, there is no meaning, there is no purpose. And the nihilists usually wind up killing themselves in the midst of the depression that they've created, trying to give some kind of power over the individual to say, hey, you don't have to live, you don't have to live underneath all this stuff. Well, they don't live under anything. They say there's really no purpose, no meaning, just figure out what it is, and that may be it, what it is for you. And they wind up depressed, and they wind up killing themselves. So the resurrection has power of the spiritual realms, has power of the physical realms, has power of the wisdom of this world. And then we just see this, this awesome thing. Romans 6, 4, and 5 kind of tells us all we need to know. It says, Therefore we have been buried with him through, death, through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. By the resurrection from the dead, we were united with Christ, okay? We, we were identified and united with Christ. This is a spiritual operation that took place in our salvation. When we were united with Christ, when he died, we died. And we died to the law, we died to the world, we died to our flesh. When we rose, we rose with him, and as he had a new life, we have new life in him. It is that new life and the basis of the power of the resurrection that gives us the opportunity and the power to change. It is power for our salvation. It is also power for our sanctification. It is power that God used to save us from the penalty of our sins, but it is also the power by which God saves us from the power that sin can have over us. It is a walk in a newness of life. I love one more modern translation that says, we walk in a brand new life. And it's not ours. It's his that he gives us when he saves us. In salvation, believers are identified with Christ in his death and resurrection. But more than that, it is Christ's resurrection power that, that basically defeats temptation, defeats trials. It leads to a holy life. It leads uh, to, to a fruitful life where we can proclaim the gospel. Listen, at our salvation and in that glorious exchange that took place when we came to know Christ, we exchanged our impotence. We exchanged our weakness for Christ's resurrection power and, and basically can know and experience all its fullness as we grow more and more in Christ. Why else would Paul say, and it's why he said it, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Now, before we get on a just a power trip, there's something else we need to read. And the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. See, sufferings are going to come to us if we're Christians. Now, you're not going to hear that in a lot of places, but you're going to hear it here, okay? You're going to hear it from me, not because I'm awesome or anything, but it's because God's made it very clear I'm supposed to teach the scriptures, and the scriptures are very clearly, Jesus said it, it's said by multiple, multiple people that God used to, to pen letters that are that are in our that, that are the scriptures today. Listen, sufferings are going to come to the Christian. Peter wrote to the believers of his day these words in 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. There are those who teach a false gospel that's based on health, wealth, and prosperity. It's like nothing's bad going to happen. Nothing bad is going to happen to you. I want you to understand the rain falls on the good and the bad. It falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. We're going to experience some problems in this world simply because we bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world, and we need to be honest enough to tell the people of the world, just as we needed to hear it too, you've sinned. You've grieved God. What you've done has has rebelled against God. You've chosen to sin. You've chosen to disregard what God said, and as a result, you're in serious trouble. In fact, you're beyond trouble. You're under God's wrath. That's not a pleasant message, but it's true. Now, the glorious thing is that, that when we preach that, yes, we're going to be persecuted, but they persecuted Jesus. 
They, they persecuted Jesus to the point of eventually killing him. Listen, Paul wrote to Timothy, everybody who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We need to understand if we're going to live a godly life in this culture, especially our culture, we're going to be persecuted. And what I'm saying, guys, is this. We present as righteousness, and, and when I say righteousness, don't think, oh, gosh, that's a big, complicated biblical word. No, it means we seek to live by what is right. And who determines what is right? Not me, not you, not some theological group of people somewhere, not the headquarters for whatever your denomination is, or like us, some non-denominational denomination, okay? They don't determine truth. God's word is truth, and it determines the truth. And if we live according to the righteousness, what is right according to by what is said in the scriptures, we're going to be persecuted in our culture. Now, when they come to us, we're seeking to live like God commands us. But let me say this, that's not a tragic thing. On the contrary, these very things, these difficulties and persecutions should be drawing us closer to Jesus as his life is seen in us. Listen, the deepest moments of spiritual fellowship with the living Christ often are during times of intense suffering. Suffering drives believers to him. We come to know him as a merciful high priest, as a faithful friend who understands our pain, as a sympathetic companion who faced all the trials and temptations that we face. That is exactly what it says in Hebrews 4.15. He is, unique, he is uniquely qualified to help us in our weaknesses because, and our infirmities because he himself lived in this flesh. He himself lived for 33 years in this world. He lived as, as a son. He lived as a sibling. He lived as an employer. He lived as somebody that was being taught a trade by his father. He, was, he lived as somebody who took over the trade of his father. He lived as someone who, as the oldest brother, had the responsibility of then seeking to train and make sure his younger brothers were ready to do what was necessary. He understood all those things. He dealt with the public. He dealt with the public who bought things from him. Listen, he understands our world because he lived in it. And he lived in it as a human, even though he is God. We actually know him better when we go through suffering. That's why Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 12, 10. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, we want to know Christ. And, and Paul said it. I want to know Christ. And man, we get excited. Yeah, I want to know him. And then we say, and then Paul says, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. And we get more stoked. Yes, I get to know Christ in the power of his resurrection. And then it hits. And in the fellowship of his sufferings. And we kind of back away a little bit, except those of us who have come to know him and have walked with him for years, we understand that the path of being a Christian is not all going to be bright lights, happiness, and people handing us teddy bears, chocolates, and flowers. Okay? That's not what it's going to be like. We're going to have tough times. We're going to have difficult times. Listen, have you ever been a part of a church? There are tough times and difficult times in churches. If you don't understand why, read the New Testament. I had a guy once tell me, I got, I've got a New Testament church. He said, well, how do you know that? He said, all the problems that were in the New Testament, they're in my church. We live amongst humans. We are humans. We are redeemed humans, but we are redeemed humans, you know, who, who yes, we're filled with the Holy Spirit, but we leak. And as a result, there are going to be problems in the church. There are going to be personal difficulties. There are going to be some financial difficulties. There's going to be some uh, just we, we all don't like the exact same things difficulties. And, and we need to learn what it's like to, to understand I'm going to enter into the sufferings of Christ. There are times I don't have to have my way all the time. And part of that is going to be difficult. But listen, uh, when we realize... Uh, Listen, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. It seems that when I'm weak is when I'm driven to the Lord Jesus. It seems that when I'm weak that I come to him and I watch him undertake on my behalf and he brings me through the most amazing and honestly, sometimes difficult. And can I be really honest with you? Because I've got friends that have lived through cancer, friends that are living through cancer. I have friends that have lost children. Uh, I have friends that have lost loved ones. I've, I've had friends who lost a loved one and then another loved one and another loved one in a, in a matter of a couple of months. There are times where it gets so difficult, you wonder if I'm going to be able to take the next step. Oh, listen, enter into knowing Christ in the fellowship of his sufferings. Why did Jesus weep 
at Lazarus' tomb when he was going to raise him just a few minutes later because Jesus experienced and embraced all it was to be a human and to lose somebody that was like a best friend. And that's why he wept. He wept because he entered into what we grasp and what we understand. He knew the joy of being with friends. He knew the joy of, of, of being around people. You know, Jesus knew the joy of bringing children up into his lap and blessing them. He knew the joy of eating with friends. He knew all these things. And we need to enter into to all the aspects of, of knowing Christ Jesus. But let me say, part of that is going to enter into his sufferings. And then Paul says, being conformed unto his death. That means this, no matter what, we are going to be identified with Jesus. We are going to say, no, I want to know Jesus. And that means absolute, complete, total submission to God, even to the point of death. And we just read it in chapter two, even death on a cross. How did God respond to that with Jesus? Oh yeah, that's right. Therefore God has highly exalted him, given him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow, every tongue would confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What a glorious, wonderful thing. <clears throat> that God is going to to work even through our sufferings to help us through this world. Well, the last thing that Paul said, and it's a really kind of a cool thing, is he says, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now, first of all, we need to realize Paul is not concerned about losing his salvation. When he says, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, he's not saying in order that, you know, I, I kind of got it, but I'm not sure I got it, and I hope I keep it, I hope I get it. No, that was not what he taught. Paul just said at the beginning of this book, he said, um, he who began a good work will, in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. So he's not concerned about losing his salvation. But Paul is thinking in terms about something else. Actually, he's saying to be, uh, to, to be so much like Christ in the way he lived that people would think of him as a resurrected person even now, even before his physical death. Now, that sounds a little wild, but let's walk it out for just a second. Dr. Ralph L. Ralph L. Kuyper puts it this way in his wonderful volume on Philippians. What does Paul mean when he desires to attain to the resurrection from the dead? There's a clue in the Greek text. The word for resurrection in verse 11 differs from the word in resurrection in verse 10, where Paul said, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. But in this one, he says, I want to, you know, uh, uh, in order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. There's a, there's a different word there used with resurrection, and it differs by putting a preposition on it, the word ek in the Greek, which is equivalent to our word out. Now, the word resurrection really literally means to, to, to have a place or to stand up. In the Greek mind, uh, living people were standing up, dead people were lying down. Okay, that's, that's pretty simple until you find somebody that's asleep. Okay, so making a Greek pun, Paul says, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering that I may give the spiritually dead a preview of eternal life in action as I'm standing up outstanding among those who are spiritually on their backs, spiritually dead. Let me go into that and, and kind of unpack it for you, okay? To put this in terms that you and I understand, because that, that's, that's some serious Greek scholar stuff going on with, with Kuiper, okay? Terms you and I get it, as I walk through the streets, as I walk into your homes, as I walk into the stores, as I walk into the office, as I mingle among people, the sons of men, I want to be so living for Christ, so outstanding for him, that you can see that I am a living one. I am a resurrected one. I am one who has the resurrection power that has changed and transformed me, even as I live among the dead ones. Now, the dead ones are is, is everybody who doesn't know Christ. They're dead in their trespasses and sins. They don't have spiritual life in them, okay? So what Paul is saying, in order that I may attain to the out-resurrection from the dead, he's saying, in effect, I want to have the power of that resurrection, the fellowship of that suffering, so that I may attain, in other words, so that, so that I might grow in such a way that people see me as a spiritually alive one when they see me in comparison to people who don't know Christ. Let me, let me put it in as simple terms as I can possibly tell you. It is when people see a Christian someone that has been transformed after they have come to Christ, and they say, there's just something so different about him, different about her now. It's like they're a different person. You better believe they're a different person. They've come to know Christ. 
They've been brought out of death into life. They've been given the very life of Christ. They've been filled with God's Holy Spirit. They've been enabled with a power that allows them to walk in such a way that they're not enslaved to the sin that comes through the world. They're not enslaved to the sin that comes through the flesh. They're not enslaved to the law. But instead, there's this different thing that's working in them. It's Christ himself. And they want to know him. And they know him in a power of the resurrection that sets them free from sin and allows them to see a continuous victory over sin, even as they're working it out. It allows them to understand that even when they go through sufferings, you know, one of the best things somebody can watch is a Christian going through sufferings that they themselves have gone through. And they ought to note something different in the way that we do it. Not that we don't cry or we don't grieve. Goodness, Paul said in Thessalonians, we grieve, but not as those who don't have any hope. Listen, when I do a funeral, I talk to people and I say, grieving is fine at a funeral. Grieving is fine when you lose someone. We grieve our loss, but we don't grieve our loss as somebody who thinks that's it. We're putting them in the ground and it's over. No, for us, we understand that, you know what, the moment they died, the scriptures say when they died physically, when they were absent from the body, they were present with the Lord. And they're going to be present with the Lord for all eternity. And then there's going to be a glorious day at the, at the, the, the resurrection of the dead, living and, uh, living and lost. There's going to be that moment at, at first at the rapture and then at the very end of the age. We're going to, we're going to be, uh, our, our bodies are going to come up out of the grave. And what's going to be awesome is, you know, and it's a spiritual thing. I don't think graves, you know, dirt's going to be flying all over the place. Um, but... You know, it, it says the dead in Christ and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds. That's talking about the rapture. I don't call it. I, I am getting to where I don't call it the rapture. I call it the great snatching away because the word rapture is actually the word that's that's in Latin. The actual word means to be snatched away, and so I want to be a part of the great snatching away. That's going to happen as Christ comes before the great tribulation period. Listen, there's going to be this glorious moment in which. We are going to be seen as those who are radically different because we know Christ. But what Paul is saying is, oh, how I long that I might attain to some of that while I'm here on the earth. That they would see me as someone who has the power of resurrection, transforming and changing their life. Is it your desire? Is it my desire to be so living in Christ and for Christ, that I would appear as a resurrected person among those who are spiritually dead in the rest of society? Because I want you to know that's exactly what Paul's saying here. And it should be our desire. And, and let me say, this doesn't come through your struggling and my struggling and striving. This comes to you via grace. It comes to you via the grace of God. Now, as you receive the grace of God, don't receive it in vain. Labor within the grace of God. Understand the grace of God. Begin believing the grace of God and not the things that the world says. But all that God would work in us. All that God would work in his church. That what we would see is that you and I and our brothers and sisters in Christ, that we want to know him. Oh, we want to know the Lord Jesus. Oh, we love him and we want to know him. We want to know him in the power of of his resurrection transforming us. We even embrace the sufferings because it will usually wean us from ourselves, so that we know him. And oh, saints, oh, precious ones of God, and I'm talking to believers, we want to know him in such a way that we might attain, even in this life, that we would be the out-resurrected ones, the the ones that, that even in this life bear that aspect of the resurrection in our character and our sweetness of speech and our, our sweet and reasonableness in this world, and yet in a boldness and in, a, in, a, in a, a love and in a transformation that would show and would make us just look so different. Not different so that we can take pride in ourselves. Absolutely not. This should be a humble and a humbled kind of thing. And it should immediately drop us on our faces if anybody were to think, hey, you are just so different. I'm not different. I'm not any different from you. The only thing that's different between the two of us is I have come to know Christ and I have the grace of God at work in my life. My God loves me. By the way, he loves you. My God showed me my sin. 
my God brought me to the point where I understood I couldn't do anything about my sin except come and accept what he did for it by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a glorious thing. And how I pray that God will give us grace that we would look like resurrected ones in the midst of those who don't know Christ and that it would lead to them wanting to glorify God as they see our good works and wanting to hear about God as they see that we're different in life, even in our sufferings, even in our sufferings and difficulties. We're just different. Why? Because of the resurrection of Jesus and knowing him in it. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Uh, Lord, this verse has always been a favorite of mine. And God, I love you for it. I thank you for it. You know, Lord, I thank you for these things. And I, I pray that you will give us grace as, as believers, God. Give us grace to, to understand who you are and to love you with all of our heart. God, I, I also pray for anyone today that when they're hearing this, they're just kind of like, that is just not what I know. I know church. I know you know, just some things about church, but you're talking about like you have an actual relationship with God. Oh Lord, I pray that this would be the day that many of those would begin to really examine themselves to see whether they're in the faith, to see whether Christ is actually in them or not, and that they have that, that desire for a greater intimacy to know him and to love him, to know him in the power of the resurrection, to know him in the sufferings, to know him uh, even in being conformed to his death so that somehow we might attain to that outworking, that, that, that vivid look that we are resurrected ones, even in the midst of a world of people who are dead spiritually. Oh God, may today be a day where they start examining that and where they come to Christ. Father, thanks again for your word. I am so grateful to you uh, for uh, giving it to me, Lord, for giving me teachers like Al Jackson, John Dale Rector, Father, like, like the guys that are the men, I'm sorry, Lord, the godly men at Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary that taught me, Lord, men within the Calvary Chapel movement who have taught me. God, I thank you for all the books that are available to help me study the scriptures and understand them better. Uh, and Lord, I just thank you for all those who have gone before me and have loved the Lord Jesus Christ and Lord been living examples to me. Thank you so much, Lord. I pray now that you'll bless those who have heard. I pray that you'll bless all of us that we might actually know and attain to the outworking of resurrection in our own lives, that people would see us as radically different. And may it be all, Lord, for your glory, your honor, and your praise. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks a bunch. Hope you have a great day, uh, God willing, and Jesus doesn't come back, because if Jesus comes back, we're all going to be listening to him, right? Uh, so uh, if if God allows me to be alive tomorrow, uh, right around noontime to like 12, 15, uh, we're going to be right back understanding and studying day by day in Paul's letter to the Philippians. Have a great day. We'll see you later.